Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Bible study today. It was quite warm. Uh, you can open a window. I don't want anyone falling asleep. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. But uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Now, this is the second uh, study in a two part mini series looking at this subject, the course of time from eternity to eternity. So it's quite a big subject, as you can imagine. And last week, we thought about the big picture. We were trying to get some idea of God's big purpose from the beginning of time to the end of time. Now, it's quite, a, quite an ambitious project to try to even get our heads around that. But we discovered, I think, last week that although God is always the same, and although the way of salvation is always the same, it's always through faith on the basis of the work of Christ by the grace of God, the way in which God has dealt with mankind has changed at different times. And so we call these eras or these periods of time, we call them dispensations. We talk about the seven dispensations of time. So that's what we did last week. We tried to get this overview, and you can see the dispensations are down here on the chart, underlined in red, and uh, coming through to grace, where we are at the moment, and then into the kingdom at the end. So we tried to get an overview uh, whether it was successful or not, I'm not sure. But today, what we're going to do is try and find our place, where we fit in to God's purpose. Brothers and sisters, that's a very important thing. It's very important that we know not just what God is doing in the history of mankind and the future of mankind, but where we fit in to this great plan. And so we're going to think about that uh, today. When you've been in the city centre, I mentioned this before, and you've seen these maps and then there's the red dot, you are here, you are here. So we're going to find out where we are in this chart. And we're going to look at that this afternoon. So it's the idea of how we fit into God's purpose and plan. Of course, just an introduction, where we are is in the church. So you have reference to the church on the uh, chart. And of course, we are part of the church. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you may not have joined a local church. You might not be part of any denomination. But nevertheless, you are a member of the church. The church which is the body of Christ. This is a wonderful thing. We're going to talk about this today. It's really the place of the church in God's purposes. So when you trusted the Lord Jesus, you didn't perhaps know about this. I certainly didn't. When you trusted the Lord Jesus... You were introduced and made part of something that is vast and grand and majestic. You were made a member of the body of Christ, a member of the church. That means that you were linked in a spiritual way to Christ who's in heaven. And not only that, but you were linked to every other believer upon earth. That's wonderful. And not only that. You're linked to believers who are already in heaven. We've been singing about that. You see, the church, we're going to see this in a moment, it consists of every believer from the day the Holy Spirit came down until the rapture. It consists of all the people who've been saved during this period. And so most of them, I suggest, are in heaven already. But the wonderful thing is, and this just occurred to me not so many years ago when a dear friend was called home, but we may lose Christians, and we feel the loss of losing a Christian. But brothers and sisters, let's remember this. The union we have with that Christian has not been broken. We still are in a great spiritual union. That's a wonderful thing. We're going to try and uh, explain that as we go through today. The church, which is the body of Christ. So when you became a believer, you became a member of the church. You're linked with every other Christian, regardless of where they worship, regardless of when they lived, regardless of where they are in the world, and each one is organically linked to the head of the body, who is Christ in heaven. That's a wonderful thing. Now we're going to discover, I hope, in our study today, where is the church, this great spiritual entity of which we form part? Where is it in God's plan? So we're going to look at it very simply. We're going to look at the past and then the present, and then the future. So that's quite straightforward. We're going to look at what God's uh, thoughts about the church uh, were in the past. Then we're going to think about the church in the present, and then we're going to see what God's plans are for the church in the future, all from the chart, I think, before us 
today. So I want to read, uh, and we're going to turn to a number of scriptures in Ephesians. So if you can turn to the letter to the Ephesians, we're going to think about the church in the past. <clears throat> the reason we didn't sing that uh, third verse of the hymn, it says that men look with wonder and they see the church split up with heresies and schisms and so on. Well, actually, the church, which is the body of Christ, can never be split up. And so you remember when the Lord Jesus prayed, just before he went to Calvary, he prayed that they all may be one. That they might be one. And you look around and you think, well, there are so many churches today, and they all meet in a different way, and they've all split up, and the prayer of Christ has not been answered. Oh, yes, it has. Oh, yes, it has. Because what the Lord Jesus was praying about was a spiritual unity. And the church, which is the body of Christ, is entirely united, can never be divided. We're going to think about the church in the past. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 3, please, if you have a Bible. If you don't, don't worry. And um, it is uh, Paul is speaking in Ephesians chapter 3 about something he calls the mystery. The mystery. Now, this is not Agatha Christie. This is not that kind of mystery. The mystery in the Bible, a mystery, any mystery, really just means something that was concealed in the past, but is now revealed. So something that was a secret, but now it's a public thing. It's open. And so Paul is talking about the mystery, and the mystery is this, that the Jews and the Gentiles should be together in one body, the church. And listen to what he says about it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. How that by revelation God made known unto me the mystery. This is what he's talking about, the church. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now listen to this. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in, the gospel, of, in Christ by the gospel. Now look at verse 9. He talks about his preaching. This is what he's doing. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. He's talking about the church. Which from the beginning, that expression really means from eternity, has been hid in God who created all things. By Jesus Christ. Now, dear friends, this is fascinating because it tells us that in the past, two things. First of all, the idea of the church was not known to other people in the past. It wasn't known to the patriarchs, wasn't known to the prophets, wasn't even known to angels. And it tells us that from eternity, before, even before the world was created, this mystery was hid in God. In other words, there was only one person who knew about it. That was God. Can you keep a secret? God kept a secret for thousands of years. And nobody knew about it. And so we discover here in our chart, here is this yellow disc here that says, The church, a mystery, hid in God. And so when we look back to the beginning of time and beyond the beginning of time, if we could do that, we discover that God had a secret plan in his heart. He told nobody about it. Didn't tell the angels. Didn't tell the patriarchs. Didn't tell the prophets. Didn't tell David the king or Solomon. Nobody in the Old Testament knew about it. It was hid in God. It was a mystery and Paul says, it's been revealed to me. Isn't that wonderful? Now, that tells us a number of things. First of all, it means that when we read our Old Testaments, you won't find one reference to the church which is his body in the Old Testament. Not one. So don't be fooled by your, maybe you've got an authorised version and there's a heading at the top that says, uh, David describes the blessings of the church. Of course, he does no such thing. He's describing the blessings of Israel. The church was not revealed in the Old Testament. David had no clue about the church 
which is the body of Christ. None of the Old Testament Christians, uh, believers, sorry, in the Lord uh, in God, none of the, the faithful of the Old Testament knew a thing about the church. You understand that? Not mentioned. So be careful reading your Old Testament. You'll find pictures that we can look back and say, well, that's a picture of the church. But a great problem among Christians today is that many go back to the Old Testament and they try to import things from the Old Testament into the church which are not about the church at all. So, for example, you go to some buildings, they're holy buildings. Where do they get that from? They get it from the Old Testament. They get it from the temple. Then there's an altar at the front. Where do they get that from? The temple or the tabernacle. And then they get people dressed up in fancy clothes and robes. Where do they get that from? They got that from the worship of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, just remember, these things have all got lessons for us in the Old Testament. But the church is not in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. And it was completely unknown and unexpected by the believers in the Old Testament. They knew nothing about this era that we can call the church era. They didn't know it even existed. It was a secret hid in God. That's important. You see, when we come here, if you just look at the chart, you've got the birth of Christ, you've got the cross, you've got the Lord Jesus ascending in Acts chapter 1. Now, you remember in Acts chapter 1, the disciples... They didn't realize that Jesus was going to die, but now they do. And the Lord has been explaining that this was what the Old Testament was teaching, that he would die on the cross, he would rise from the dead. And now, you know what they say to him in Acts chapter 1? Lord, are you going to now restore the kingdom? They think that immediately now he has died and been raised from the dead, the kingdom is going to start. The millennium, the reign of Christ, they say, Lord, You've died on the cross, you've been raised from the dead, now it's the kingdom. That's the next great event in the plan. And the Lord Jesus says, wait a minute now. There's a whole period in here that you know nothing about that is going to open up. And there's going to be the church era. The kingdom is going to be set up on earth. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in the meantime, there is this period here where what was a secret in the past is now being revealed in the present. You know, the old Bible teachers used to talk about the trains. That was in the days when there were trains around. <laughs> and uh, they could go on a line upon. And they would say that, well, you know, Israel's like a train, and, and it comes along, and the train is taken off the main line, and it's put into the siding. And then it's put into the siding because there's another train coming through. And then when that train goes through, then the other train comes back off the siding onto the main line. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel was on the main line. Israel was on the main line, steaming along. All God's purposes were to do with Israel. Ah, but when the New Testament came, and when Christ was rejected and crucified, there's something different happening now, and the nation of Israel is now put into the siding. It's, it's still there, it's waiting, it's waiting. And at the moment, there's another train that's going through the main line, on the main line, and it's the church. And when the church age has passed, then Israel's going to come back on again. I think it's quite a good illustration. You may disagree. <laughs> but uh, but uh, they used to illustrate it like that. So we are now living in an era which was a complete mystery. It was hidden. It was a secret in the Old Testament times. So when we think about the church in the past, remember, it was hidden in God from eternity. Now the wonderful thing is, if you read, we're not going to turn to this, but Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we, individual believers, were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's just absolutely staggering. Don't ask me to explain it. I've never heard anyone explain it properly or adequately yet, because I don't think it is explainable. But it's believable, and I believe it. <laughs> and I believe that in some way I don't understand, before even sin entered into the world, God chose the church in Christ before the foundation of the world. And God's great secret is, has, been, has been kept hidden from men in the past, and we come to the present. So the church in the past is a secret. It's been hidden. The church in the present. Well, this is the age that we're in at the moment. The church of God, the body of Christ, the household of faith, are people for his name. 
And it begins, this era, with a dramatic event, and it ends with a dramatic event. What was the event at the beginning? It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was the day of Pentecost. Now, brothers and sisters, let's be clear about this. The Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament, but not in the same way as he is today. And the Holy Spirit will be active when the church has gone and, and there's this tribulation period. People will be converted then, and it will be through the working of the Holy Spirit. He will be active then, but not in the same way as he is today. The Holy Spirit, we could call this the era of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is here in a special way. And he came on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. You remember the tongues of fire that appeared, and the rushing mighty wind that filled the house, and he spoke in tongues, and the Holy Spirit had come. And two things are unique about this age in which we live. One is that every individual believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And secondly... There is an entity in which the Holy Spirit dwells, and that is the church, the body of Christ. And so it began with the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's going to end at the rapture. We which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And in a certain sense, the special presence of the Holy Spirit on earth will end with the removal of the church. The entire church will be removed. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church, we were talking about this a few weeks ago, you might remember, that the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believers on earth has a tremendous effect upon the world. We don't know half. It restrains the outpouring of evil. And when the church is removed and the presence, the special presence of the Holy Spirit within the church, then evil is going to explode in the tribulation period. So, this era begins with the coming of the Holy Spirit. It ends, in a certain sense, with the removal of the Holy Spirit in the church. It is the church in the present. Now, we turn again to uh, the letter to the Ephesians, please. Because in this chap, in this book, it's all about the church. And in this letter, Paul describes the church in three ways. We just think about that in the present, very, very simply. First of all, look at chapter 1. Uh, he's speaking in verse 21, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. He's talking about the Lord Jesus, how he's been exalted. Look at verse 21, it's a wonderful verse. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He's talking about the exaltation of Christ. And, verse 22, he's put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So this is the first figure Paul uses. He says the church in the present time is the body of Christ. Now, um, it may be strange to think about it like this, but your body, one of the great functions of your body is to express who you are. You know, you can tell by people's faces sometimes what they think of what you're saying. <laughs> because because our, and our personalities, we express, if we didn't have a body, if we were just spirits, we couldn't express ourselves in a way that people could know who we were. We express, one, of the, one of the uses of the body, the reason that we have a body, is so we can express our personality. Brothers and sisters, you belong to a spiritual entity, which is the expression of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And so the Lord Jesus presently exalted, as we've been reading, high above all principality and power. He's the head. He's the head of the body. But meanwhile, we are his members on earth. The Lord is not here personally, but we're here. His body is here. It's a wonderful privilege. And so in this era, as we've been saying already, when someone's converted, they become a member of the body of Christ. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was the birthday of the church. The body of Christ began, you might say, and every believer now is part of the body of Christ. Now, it's not a case of the Jews becoming like Gentiles. And it's not the case of the Gentiles becoming Jews. Because if you turn over, please, in Ephesians uh, to chapter 2, I think it is, 
Uh, chapter 2, <clears throat> and look at verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of the two, that is of Jew and Gentile, one new man. So it's not that we have to become Jews in this era. And it's not that Jews have to become Gentiles. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you have to become a member of a new man. What's the new man? It's the body of Christ. And so it's a wonderful privilege we have. I hope we understand this. I understand these are big concepts to take in, but just to think that we are part of a spiritual entity that is linked organically to Christ in heaven. Wonderful. No wonder we believe that a Christian can never be lost. Once you're part of the body, you're part of the body. That's it. You're secure. You're absolutely part of the body of Christ. And so Paul describes it first as a body. Then look at chapter 2, the second picture he uses of the church. Chapter 2 and verse 20. He's talking about the, the Christians there. He says in verse 20, You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fritly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. In other words, he says, the church is not just the body of Christ, it's a building. It's a building. And you've been built into this building. Well, of course, immediately you think about that, you go back to Matthew chapter 16, don't you? You remember the Lord Jesus says, you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, just to clarify this, the rock is not Peter. Uh, the word for Peter means a stone. It's a small stone. In fact, Peter later talks about himself as a living stone. Uh, so the Lord is really saying, you are a stone, but upon this massive base rock, I will build my church. What's the massive base rock? It's just what Peter has just said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The foundation is Christ. The foundation is Christ. And the Lord Jesus is building you know, some of our building projects go wrong, and some is they're never completed, and some is they're a disaster. Well, the wonderful thing is, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is the master builder, and he's building his church. And we were just, someone was mentioning in prayer, maybe it was Abe today, mentioning in prayer about people being saved. You know, when, when people say, that's another stone in the building, that's another stone in the building, and the Lord Jesus says, I'm building my church, and he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so you're not just part of the body of Christ, wonderful though that is, you're part of a building that is growing. And that building is like a holy temple in which God is dwelling. And one day the last stone's going to be put in and the building's going to be complete. And so you're a body presently and you are in a building. But then turn over please to Ephesians chapter 5. We're still thinking about the church in the present and as we think of Ephesians chapter 5, and you can turn to the end of the chapter. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the chapter, Paul is talking about the relationship between a man and his wife. And uh, look at verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. No man have yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So in other words, Paul is saying in Ephesians, the church is the body of Christ, the church is the building of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ. In other words, uh, the, the Lord Jesus, you see, the Bible began with a marriage. And it will end with a marriage. It's no wonder that marriage is under satanic attack today. It's absolutely no wonder. It, 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 it's men are trying to, they think they're just acting in their own self-interest. It's a satanic attack on marriage. Because God began with a marriage and he'll end with a marriage. The marriage in the beginning was the prototype for all marriages, Adam and Eve. And so the Lord Jesus continually went back to the beginning, to Adam and Eve, because it's the prototype of marriage. The marriage at the end is the marriage supper of the Lamb 
And it's when Christ, and so you read in the book of Revelation, John refers again and again to the bride, the bride. And the story of mankind, God's purposes, begins with a marriage and ends with a marriage. And presently, we're not just the body of Christ and the building of Christ, we're the bride of Christ. And the scripture we've read already in chapter 1 tells us that uh, we are the complement of him who fills all in all. There was a certain sense, now we've got to be careful what we say here, there's a certain sense in which Adam was incomplete without his bride. Now, there is nothing missing, there's nothing lacking to Christ. But the Bible says that he is going to have, throughout eternity, he's going to have this spiritual entity, his bride with him, that corresponds exactly to him, the complement of him who fills all in all. Now, these are wonderful things. We can hardly take them in. But that's where we are at the moment. Uh, if you're a Christian, and, and you might be part of a, of a local church as small as this local church, and you might think, well, it's just a very poor, small congregation. We're not, we don't amount to much. I, I encourage you to take a bigger view of the church, which is the body of Christ, the building of Christ, the bride of Christ. You are immensely privileged to live in this era and to be part of this wonderful company, the body of Christ. That's where we are in God's purposes. So, often it's been said, you know what a parenthesis is? Parenthesis, it means something in brackets. And so we were taught at school that when you write a sentence and then you come to something in brackets, you could actually take that out of the, out of the sentence and the sentence still makes sense. And so we were always taught that this era here is in brackets. You take this out and the story just runs straight on from here, from the resurrection of Christ, onto him setting up his kingdom, and so on. And so this era here is in brackets. Remember, it's a secret hid in God uh, from eternity unknown to other men. What about the future then? And uh, there'll be time for questions at the end, if anyone has questions. Uh, maybe you have. Well, I just want to point out that there are four things about the future of the church. And this is your future. Remember, this is not some abstract thing. This is your future. The first thing about the church is it's going to be raptured. We all start with R, which is quite handy to remember. First of all, it's going to be raptured. And so the era of the church where we are at the moment comes to an end when the Lord Jesus himself descends from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ rise, and the living are caught up together. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it, the Latin for rapture is the word uh, uh, that uh, Paul uses to talk about being caught up, caught up, being raptured. That's the idea. And so, brothers and sisters, that's the, na the next great event. We're not waiting for the Antichrist to appear. We're not waiting for the tribulation to begin. We're waiting, as the Christians of Thessalonica were, we're waiting for his Son from heaven. We're waiting for the Lord to come. That's the great hope that we have. It could happen this very afternoon. There's nothing to be fulfilled before the Lord comes. And so the first great event in the future, and it may not be far in the future, is the rapture. We're going to be raptured. But then, after the rapture, what's going to happen after that? I never thought about that. What are we going to do after the rapture? Well, first of all, there's going to be the review. The review. The judgment seat. The judgment seat. The Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. What that simply means is that after the rapture, when we're caught up to be with the Lord, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's a bit like Paul uses the same word, for example, um, a lot of Paul's writings, the background is the games, isn't it? You know, the Greek games and so on. And, and he uses the, the same word as the awards podium at the end. And so the athletes are, are standing and they're being awarded. They're being, now, nobody's being punished there. Well, well I hope they are. I know some of the communist countries, if they didn't do well in the Olympics, they'll put in jail when they're home. But uh, normally we don't punish people if they don't win a race. Uh, we reward the ones that do. And so we're going to stand, Christians, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, not for our sins to be brought up. 
Our sins will never be brought up again. I'm thankful of that. Very thankful. All my sins were dealt with when the Lord Jesus died on the cross. Every single one. And there are sins I've committed, I don't even know I've committed them. But Christ paid the price for every single one. And God will never, ever raise them again. But he will review, the Lord Jesus will review my service, my faithfulness. This is what the judgment seat's all about. So the rapture, the review. And the Bible says everyone standing before the judgment seat will have praise from God. I don't believe there is a single Christian in existence who will not receive some kind of praise. I believe that. I know that the Bible talks about being saved as if by fire. In other words, it's somebody that's, that uh, you can imagine the scene, the house is on fire and the man or the woman is snatched from the house but everything that they've labored for and everything they've lived for and everything they own has gone up in smoke. Well, at least they're saved. Well, I used to think as a boy, I just want to be saved, that's all. I just want, I just want to be sure that I'm not going to be in hell, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm not really worried about the reward. But the grace of God is such that he helps us to serve him and then he gives us a reward for doing it. <laughs> so it's wonderful. It's all of grace, really. And so the Bible talks about rewards being given out at the judgment seat of Christ. And so after the rapture, there's going to be the review. But then thirdly, something else. Something you're going to participate in. You're going to participate in the revelation. Because we talk about the coming of Christ, the second coming in two parts. The rapture, where he takes the church away, and the revelation, when he comes in power and glory to set up his kingdom on earth. And when he comes, we've got to hear the king of kings being revealed. And uh, th there's quite a contrast between the two comings. In, in the rapture, the Lord Jesus comes to the air. And then he takes the church, as he said in John chapter 14, it was quoted in prayer today, that he's coming so that we can be with him where he is. He's going to conduct us into the Father's house. But when he comes in the revelation... He is coming not to the air, he's coming to the earth. And the Bible says his feet are going to stand upon the Mount of Olives. And he is coming in power and glory. And when he comes, you're going to be with him. You're going to be with him. You're going to be revealed with him. And the Bible says this, that he is going to come to be admired in all those who believe. And that is, brothers and sisters, you think of this. That when the Lord Jesus comes with all the glorified hosts of heaven and the saints with him, people are going to look at the Christians of the present era. People that have been downtrodden, persecuted, treated as nothing, as rubbish, as worth nothing. And they're going to recognize that they are now resplendent in the glory of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to be revealed with him when he is revealed. And so, and so we're going to be raptured. We're going to be rewarded or reviewed and we're going to be revealed and the Lord is coming back to the earth now what's going to happen after that ever thought about that what are you going to do in the millennium well you're going to reign that's what you're going to do you're going to reign the church is going to reign with Christ isn't that wonderful so for a thousand years uh, we've left all, all everything below this line we're not even talking about uh, because it's, it's quite complex and uh, We've got enough on our plate. <laughs> but uh, but uh, this, this seven-year period of tribulation uh, sees the rise of the Antichrist and so on. And when the Lord Jesus is revealed, comes back to earth with his church, it is to deal with the Antichrist and it is to set up his kingdom and he's going to reign on earth. Israel and Judah are going to be reunited. They're going to be one nation. They're going to be the head nation. They're going to be the top nation. And the Lord Jesus is going to reign. Now it's suggested that this is how it's going to work. That the Lord Jesus is reigning. And he's reigning through the church. And the church are reigning through Israel. And Israel is reigning. The, the saved, the glorified saints, perhaps of Old Testament times, I'm not quite sure. But the, the church, the Israel is going to reign through, there's going to be a representative of the Lord Jesus on earth from David's line. 
This is quite complicated, isn't it? It's absolutely fascinating. And there's going to be an administration. That's a word, dispensation. There's going to be a dispensation when the Lord Jesus is reigning in power and glory. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. The world as we know it is going to be transformed. You see, what's going to happen is this. During the tribulation period, the world is going to go through tremendous upheaval. It's going to be unrecognizable with the judgments of God. When the Lord Jesus comes, the Bible says creation is going to be liberated from the bondage of corruption. It's going to be almost back to, to pre-fall conditions. When everything was perfect, the Lord Jesus is going to reign. He's going to rule. And dear brother, dear sister, you're going to reign with him. Isn't that wonderful? And I suggest to you, because of course that's not the end of the story, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth comes to an end. There is the great white throne where the lost, now you'll never be there, you won't be in the great white throne, don't worry about it. Christians go all mixed up about, about the saved and the unsaved, They're all being mixed up and, and, and God deciding who gets into heaven and who doesn't. That's nothing in the Bible, nothing like that in the Bible. You will not be in the great white throne. Everyone here in the great white throne is already lost. The great white throne is to demonstrate God's righteousness and judging them. And when all has been judged and the heavens and the earth are removed, then John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to reign with Christ. Now, aren't you, aren't you thrilled to think what's going to happen in the future? And uh, when, when you think about the, the eternal state, I don't we take that in. Can we take that in? Can we take the eternal state in? When we think about eternity in the future, we don't really know what it's going to be like. But I'll tell you this, wherever Christ is, you're going to be. Wherever Christ is, he's going to have a bride by his side, bought by his precious blood. And you're going to form part of that. Isn't that wonderful? It should thrill our hearts. If I've made it dusty and dry and complicated, I apologize. But these truths should absolutely thrill us. That we were part of God's plan when nobody knew a thing about it in the Old Testament. And none of the prophets knew. And it was a mystery. It was a secret. God kept it in his heart. It's been revealed, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And presently we form part of the body of Christ. And, and the building that he is building. And, and the bride that he loves and gave himself for. And in the future we're going to be raptured. We're going to be reviewed. We're going to be revealed with Christ in glory. And we're going to reign with him. Now, let me just read one verse to finish in Ephesians. I strongly recommend you read Ephesians 10. Just read through the whole letter. It won't take you long. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 4, just as we close. But God... He's been describing how we sinners of the Gentiles had nothing, we had no claim on God. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Now listen to this. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I don't really know what eternity is going to be like, but I'll tell you what it's going to be in one respect at least. God is going to say to wandering worlds, look at these people. Look at these people. He's going to demonstrate his grace that in the ages to come, people will be wondering these poor people from Ock and surrounding area who deserve hell and judgment, here they are in the highest glory, the bride of Christ. And it will be, you will be, you know, sometimes we say, you know, that person's a trophy of grace. Well, so are you, and so am I. And one day, God is going to display to the, to the wandering universe the glories of his grace, and he's going to do it through you and through me when we're in glory. Isn't it wonderful? That's something to look forward to. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give thanks that we're able to, in some measure, appreciate these things. We feel how far short we come in our understanding, and we pray that our eyes may be opened, as, as Paul prayed even in chapter 1 of this letter, that their eyes would be opened, their understanding would be opened, 
that they would appreciate the greatness of these things. Help us to get some sense of the glories into which we've been brought. And may it be that we live our lives uh, in the light of all that we've been brought into. We pray for thy blessing now. We thank you for our time together. We give thanks for the refreshments we're going to enjoy now in the Saviour's name. Amen. Amen.